Hello. In this discussion, we're going to take a look at social psychology. We're going to start with a good working definition. And social psychology can be defined as the branch of psychology that involves basically how people think, how they feel, as well as how they behave in social situations. So let's focus for just a minute on that term social situations. And so we just want to keep in mind, you know, when it, we're talking about social situations, well, that basically refers to situations where a person can be alone or in the presence of others or even in front of a crowd. Okay, and going just a little bit further, we also want to keep in mind that uh, one's sense of self is very influential on basically how we um, interact with other people, how we basically use our cognition, how we use our emotions in that process of interaction. So a good definition of sense of self is, according to this, unique sense of our self-identity, which is influenced by social, cultural, and psychological experiences. Let's go just a little bit further. So there are two basic uh, key research areas that we want to be aware of for social psychology. The first is what's called social cognition. Okay, and social cognition, you know, that refers to how we form impressions of other people. So basically how we interpret the meaning of other people's behavior and how our behavior is in turn affected by our attitudes. So we're just talking, you know, we're focusing a little bit about the mental processes that we engage in when we are basically interpreting uh, other people's behavior and how our behavior is affected by our attitudes. Okay. The other key research area that we want to be aware of is what's known as social influence. And basically that's when we are more focused on how our behavior is affected by other people and by situational factors. So when we attribute our behavior as being the result of how somebody else is behaving or certain scenarios in which we are engaged that cause us to uh, basically engage in different types of cognition that result in basically how we interpret the meaning of other people's behavior or how our behavior is being affected by our own attitudes. Okay, going forward. Okay, so we created this diagram right here because we're, we'll take a look at this. Just uh, bear with me. Uh, we will take a look at these in more um, we'll kind of narrow our focus on each one of these a little more in depth. Okay, but basically at the very top here, we listed person perception. Okay, so how we perceive others, other people. Okay, and then they can be categorized in a certain way. Basically, that is social categorization and Please keep in mind, we will look at these in depth as we proceed. Okay, and that is closely connected to implicit personality theory. Basically, what we're, how we're implying how others, the reason why they are acting in, in such a certain way. Okay, and attribution, really closely related. Okay, when we're taking a look at different attitudes, especially attitudes of others or attitudes of ourselves, that can influence basically how we perceive others, as well as stereotypes. 
Okay, so right in the center of all that, you'll see that we put a note here that says social cognition, you know, remember that refers to the mental processes that we people tend to use to make sense of our environment, our social environment. Okay, so when it comes to perceiving others, basically uh, that is known as person perception. And person perception is basically mental processes that we tend to engage in in order to form judgments about other people. Okay, so uh, down below here we listed four key components or principles that influence our decision about making judgments about others. Okay, so the first of these is, well, characteristics of the person you're trying to evaluate. All right, so basically, um, well, certain characteristics that the uh, other person might be demonstrating can influence our decisions and, on how we perceive others. Okay, closely related to that is our own self-perception as well as our own personal goals in the situation. And last but not least, the specific situation in which the process occurs. So we will take a little bit of a closer look in this. Um, you know, so definitely um, the characteristics of the person we're trying to evaluate, well, um, well, we're, so we're looking at categorization, okay? So shortcuts in our personal perception, putting people in categories. So that is the mental processes, process of categorizing people into groups or social categories on the basis of their shared characteristics. Okay, and so I listed a couple things right here, you know, a couple terms down below here. And uh, so the first of these terms is um, explicit cognition. That is, expli you know, explicit means basically that's when we are consciously engaging in certain processes. So that tends to be um, deliberate conscious mental processes involved in our how we perceive, how we judge, how we make decisions, and uh, in our reasoning processes. Okay, and then you'll notice in parentheses on the second phrase right here, I said implicit cognition. So implicit cognition basically just refers to um, basically automatic or unconscious mental processes that tend to influence our perceptions and judgments, decisions, and reasoning processes. And the third term I would like to make you aware of is at the bottom of this slide, and that is called implicit personality theory right here. Okay, so basically that just refers to is basically we have a a, a network of uh, certain assumptions or beliefs about the relationship um, among different types of people and their traits or their behaviors. And that leads to the use of basically what we call cognitive schemas. So that is per implicit personality theory. Moving forward. Okay, so when we um, basically, when it comes to um, one, one of those schemas, we, you might remember I mentioned the term schema a little bit earlier. One of the schemas basically is uh, attractiveness. So attractive people, well, they, they are, you know, generally they tend to be perceived as being more intelligent kind of happier and better adjusted, okay? And uh, so 
Also, they tend to be higher in self-esteem, intelligence, and other desirable personality traits than people of more average appearance. And last but not least, you know, attractive people, they tend to receive a little more attention and more favorable treatment from other people throughout their lives. Okay, so, you know, so such as, you know, favorable treatment from their parents, from their teachers, uh, from peers and employers. Okay, so you might notice from this picture right here, this picture right here uh, in the lower right here, well, that is that is a scene basically from the film. It's a Disney film called Enchanted. Okay, and basically, you know, you, you notice that the, the sweet, innocent princess on the left, you know, tends to be beautifully dressed and perfectly groomed. Okay, but the person on the right is the wicked stepmother, you know, as, you know, an old woman, you know, complete with a wart on her chin. A little bit less attractive for most. That's just an example of how, um, us, you know, the schema of attractiveness works. So, you know, because we're culturally conditioned, you know, to associate beauty with goodness and uh, evil with ugliness. Okay, moving forward just a little bit. All right, so when we're talking about attractiveness, you know, well, from the neuroscientific perspective, well, certain parts of our brain actually activate when we see um, basically an attractive person that is making eye contact with us. Okay, so on the left hand, on the top left hand side, you can see that this uh, this lady is directly looking into uh, uh, the camera, hence eye contact, and then the non-eye contact face is on the right hand side, okay? Well, the eye contact, you know, remember said that kind of ignites, you know, uh, certain parts of the brain, and I, w I went ahead and listed a couple of those, you know, direct eye contact with a physically attractive person, well, that activates what's called the ventral striatum or striatum, however you like to pronounce that, okay? And so that's the part of the brain, you know, that tends to predict uh, reward. Like, hey, good things are going to happen here, you know, and um, you'll be rewarded for, you know, this th This beauty will, re you know, result in uh, something positive for, for oneself. Be rewarded for that eye contact. Okay, a couple other areas here I, d I did list, you know, is the orbital frontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala. And those are all responsive to the reward value of attractive faces. Okay, moving forward. Okay, so when it comes to Explaining behavior. Some of the terms that we talked about a little bit earlier on that uh, circle of um, examples. Basically, one of those was attribution. That's like how we tend to explain behavior. Others' behavior as well as our own. But so attribution, you know, that's the mental processes. Okay, that is, remember, that refers to cognitive processes of inferring the causes of other people's behavior, including our own behavior. Okay, so I listed a few of the uh, common attributional biases and explanatory patterns. So basically, how we tend to be biased, okay, uh, in how making those inferences, and uh, how, you know, those biases basically affect our how we explain why, you know, the behavior, the explanatory patterns. Okay, so we're going to take a look at these. Um, feel free to pause the video after each one of these and, and jot down some notes if you're um, seeking to uh, 
gain further insight into these and to um, think about these. Okay, so one of these attributional biases is what's called fundamental attributional error. So basically that fundamental attributional error, that refers to um, basically it's kind of like the tendency to attribute the behaviors of other to their own internal and personal characteristics, you know, while ignoring or underestimating the effects of their external situational factors. Okay, so basically that just is uh, saying, hey, you know, the um, this person is behaving this way because that's the kind of person they just are and that we're not taking into account uh, that the certain scenario, you know, um, might be responsible for their behavior. Okay, the second bias is what's called actor observer bias. And basically, well, that's kind of when we uh, attribute our own behavior to external um, situational characteristics, you know, while we ignore um, or underestimate the effects of our internal personal fac uh, factors. So what I mean by that in easier language, basically, well, we, when we take, um, we attribute our own behavior because we might say, hey, that's just, um, that's just the way I am. You know, I tend to be a, uh, a successful, motivated person. Well, that is actor observer bias. Okay. The third type of bias is what's called blaming the victim. And that's just when we tend to, uh, well, we blame an, an innocent victim of mis misfortune for having somehow caused the problem or for, for not having taken the steps that were necessary in order to avoid or prevent it from happening. Okay, the next type of bias is what's known as hindsight bias. Okay, and that's basically, that's the tendency to overestimate one's ability to have foreseen or predicted the outcome of an event. So hindsight bias is basically when when one hears something or sees something, something like that, somebody tells them something and they go, oh yeah, I already knew that. I knew that um, even though they may not have. So they're, you know, tending to um, basically overestimate their own ability. Okay, so the self-serving bias basically just refers to well, that's when we want to uh, basically protect our self-esteem, save face, you know, when we're facing failure. So engaging in certain types of uh, behaviors or something so we can, we don't look bad. We're trying to basically uh, protect our sense of self-esteem and how we look to others. Okay, the last type of bias is what's known as self-effacing bias. And that's basically, that's when we tend to blame ourselves for our failures, you know, and we attribute them to internal personal causes and, um, you know, and kind of downplay our success by attributing that to uh, external situational causes. So basically that's just saying, hey, um, I failed because I always fail. I'm just not a successful person. You know, that kind of thing. Even though, you know, the one's failure might be due to um, situational external causes. Okay, so um, so when we use attitudes, we can use our certain attitudes about things as uh, ways to justify when uh, injustice or discrimination or prejudice occurs. You know, so 
basically justifying if something is not uh, just. Okay, so anyway, uh, let's take a look at some of these. So basically, uh, the just world hypothesis is the assumption that life is fair. Okay, so um, so sometimes, you know, uh, it might seem, you know, kind of horrible that you can be a good person and bad things could happen to you anyway. All right, so like, wow, I can't believe this happened. You know, I'm, you know, this, that person or myself, you know, uh, don't, don't deserve that. Okay. So that kind of a uh, hypothesis, by the way, you know, that tends to um, lead to, you know, like blaming the victim. So when others, you know, um, experience something, you know, we say, hey, that's their own fault. They brought it on themselves. Okay. They deserve that. Okay, but in a, the next bias down in the middle here is self-serving bias. And basically that's when people, uh, well, they tend to credit themselves for their successes and to blame their failures on external circumstances. So if something good happens, they go, yep, I did this. And if something bad happens or they don't feel successful, then they blame it on something else or somebody else. Okay. Now, the self-effacing bias, basically, you know, that's in more collectivistic type cultures. Well, that involves blaming their failures on themselves, on internal personal factors, while attributing success to external situation factors. Okay, so basically, you know, when um, that refers to when a person doesn't uh, experience success, you know, they tend to blame it on themselves. But if they do experience success, they will attribute that to basically somebody or something else outside of themselves, like a family or um, a certain type of scenario that, it, you know, that they didn't originate within themselves. Okay. And finally here, we're going to take a look at fundamental attribution error. Okay. And so that's basically the tendency to uh, spontaneously attribute the behaviors uh, of others to internal personal characteristics while ignoring or underestimating the role of situational factors. So we, yeah, it might sound familiar. We did talk a little bit, little bit about that earlier. And so basically that just means when somebody is not acting in a certain way, that we feel that is um, acceptable or successful or something, we tend to blame it on them. We say, hey, that's because they're just, they're just that kind of person. And we tend to kind of ignore basically what they might be going through in life, you know, what might be um, happening in their lives. Okay, going forward here. Okay, so when we're going to talk about a little bit about the social psychology of attitudes, well, we want, kind of want to be, um, before we proceed on, you know, kind of uh, analyzing this slide here, we just kind of want to keep in mind that the term attitude, basically, that is our tendency that we learn. It's a learned tendency to basically evaluate um, objects, people, or issues in a, per, in a particular way. Okay? So that is one's attitude. They tend to evaluate, you know, people or issues in a particular way, or even objects. Okay, so basically when it comes to talking about attitude, well, there's, a, there's three different components that we want to focus on for a minute, and that is the cognitive components. Okay, so basically, you know, our thoughts and conclusions about 
a topic or a situation, okay, and the affective, that's our feelings or emotions about the certain topic, okay. And last but not least, the third component is behavior or behavioral, and that's actions that we perform regarding the topic or situations. Okay, so example here is in this photo here, right here. There's student protesters uh, from India. You know, they're calling for an end to basically uh, large dam projects in their country. And uh, so these students, they tend to believe that large dams have a negative environmental impact, um, especially on parts of the country downriver from the dams. Okay, so they hold strong opinions and express themselves openly. And so they're at it, they have a, you know, a certain attitude. Okay, they're evaluating objects or issues in a particular way. Okay, so we talked about, you know, the different components of attitudes, okay? And uh, so we talked about the cognitive components, the affective or, you know, attitude, you know, basically the behavioral component, all right, excuse me, as well as the emotional component. Okay, so the cognitive component, whenever we hear the term cognitive, we always just want to keep... Uh, stay aware that that refers to thinking processes, okay, how we are thinking. And the behavioral component, well, basically uh, that's our predisposition to act in a particular way. And uh, so I gave some examples here about fast food, okay. Um, I will not uh, elaborate on these. Feel free to pause the video and look at these examples here. Okay, and the final component is the emotional component. So basically, how we feel about an ab, you know, an ad, um, basically um, how we feel about a, an added an attitude, and um, you know, we you know, so a good example here is you know, like this person is saying, you know, fast food is disgusting. I hate their greasy fries and their fake milkshakes. Okay, and so etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is more of an emotional type response. But remember, this is we're talking about the social perspective of psychology and or a branch of psychology. And uh, we want to uh, keep in mind that we're talking about, well, how we socially interact with our environment. Okay, so feel free to pause the video here and come up with as many um, answers as you feel you can. This is not a test, um, but uh, basically, um, you know, just kind of, uh, kind of, you know, check out what you think and uh, what you feel about this, okay? So here is the sentence to complete. Basically, you are most likely to behave in accordance with your attitudes when. So, feel free to pause the video here, come up with some examples, and we'll talk about this in just a when you come back. Okay, welcome back. So, some of the answers that we came up with here um, basically, you're most likely to behave in accordance with your attitudes when, first of all, um, well, we anticipate a favorable outcome or response from others for behaving that way. Okay, another um, answer is basically um, our attitudes are extreme or are frequently expressed. So we tend to behave in accordance with our attitudes when those attitudes are extreme or expressed very frequently. Okay, and another answer is 
Well, we behave in accordance with our attitudes when um, they're basically, they are based uh, through direct experience, through repetition, okay? Or we tend to behave in accordance with our attitudes when we are, we are very knowledgeable about a certain subject. Okay, and last but not least, you know, um, we tend to behave in accordance with our attitudes when we have a, well, we have a vested interest in the subject, and we basically stand to gain personally or lose something on a specific issue. So we either stand to gain or to lose in a particular situation. Hope this helped. Let's go a little bit further. Okay, so we're going to start talking about interpersonal attraction and liking. So basically, you know, what tends to make us find another person more attractive than others? And so, you know, there's, you know, I listed a few of the personal characteristics, you know, things like um, trustworthiness. You know, they tend to be warm or adventurous, or they might have social status. You know, tend to be a popular person. Okay. And uh, when it comes to um, physical appearance, well, there's a lot to look at here. You know, so these are all, you know, pictures of what others consider to be attractive individuals. Okay, so they might have... Uh, Big smiles, wide smiles, and high, uh, high eyebrows. Their pupils tend, might be dilated, and their lips are full. They have full lips, and um, so, but, you know, men and women tend to find those attributes a little more attractive. Okay, and uh, so, let's go a little bit further here, and uh, so... Basically, you know, some of the, um, there's other uh, aspects too. So um, things like, you know, we tend to be attracted to, well, people who are a lot like ourselves, you know, perceive as being like us, have similar um, values and uh, certain, you know, uh, behavioral aspects, things like that. Okay. Or people who are more familiar, tend, people we tend to see on a regular basis and like, oh yeah, I know this person. Okay, and then last but not least, uh, one of the last aspect here that we have listed here is the socioeconomic and cultural environment. So this gets to be pretty interesting, you know. Um, I'd be curious to uh, hear your thoughts on this, you know, but definitely, you know, studies have shown that basically, you know, like, you know, men tend to, um, you know, in a certain society where in their society um, where their food and resources are in short supply, well, they tend to prefer heavier women. Whereas, you know, if they tend to be in a uh, environment where basically resources are more abundant, they men tend to prefer thinner women. Just some examples for you. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, so we're going to talk about, um, well... How does our behavior, or how do others' behavior, affect our attitudes? Okay, so there's a term here I, did, I put in bold font, which is cognitive dissonance. Okay, and uh, so basically cognitive dissonance, you know, um, a good... Um, oh, excuse me there, sorry about that, I was experiencing technological issues. Um, cognitive dissonance, you know, basically 
Well, I've um, a good definition would be basically when we feel unpleasant, we have an unpleasant state of psychological tension. That is dissonance. And the cognitive part of that occurs when there is an inconsistency between two thoughts or perceptions. Okay, so we might experience cognitive uh, dissonance, you know, when we're in a situation and uh, we are actually perceiving that situation as being, well, it's kind of both good and, po and bad. And we might experience a little bit of cognitive dissonance, like which way do we go with this, you know? Okay, so cognitive dissonance, you know, as, as listed here, you know, it tends to be very unpleasant and it causes people uh, to be strongly motivated to reduce that feeling, that cognitive dissonance. Okay, and uh, but what is interesting here from the psychological perspective is well, um, cognitive dissonance, you know, can lead us to quickly adjust our attitudes um, without even realizing it. Okay, and you see in parentheses here, I did put social neuroscience research. And basically that suggests that cognitive dissonance can lead to attitude change very quickly. Um, perhaps without us even realizing that the process is occurring. Okay, moving forward here, and I promise we're going to elaborate a little bit further in just a moment on all of this, okay? So when it comes to cognitive dissonance, here's an example. I thought it would be best to basically kind of, um, well, you know, just talk about this a little bit. You know, so people, you know, they, they, tend, they have a tendency, they, they want to seek ways uh, to, dis, to decrease their discomfort caused by any type of inconsistency they, that they are um, basically um, seeing or assessing. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, you know, so if, if one can rationalize or explain one's behavior, well, the cognitive dissonance or the conflict or the tension, that is, uh, tends to be uh, eliminated or avoided even. But if we can't, if we can't explain our own, our behavior, um, well, um, we sometimes, if we can't explain it, we tend to um, possibly change our attitude so that it's in harmony with our behavior. Okay, so that right there, you know, feel free to pause the video here and take a look at this. I actually uh, gave the examples right here, you know, so this is, well, this is basically when when one changed one's attitude, right down below here, the attitude change right here, participant number two, okay, as a result of the cognitive dissonance, all right, and that caused them to change their behavior and their attitude uh, in order to, well, kind of uh, experience a little bit less uh, of the, uh, the issue. Okay, participant number one at the top here, this is the, the individual that basically well, did not really experience any conflict, didn't know uh, cognitive dissonance, so they ended up not even changing their attitude. So they had the same attitude as they had in the beginning. You can see right here, you know, their original attitude was, ooh, eating grasshoppers? Yuck. And then at the very final attitude, no attitude change. You know, they said, you know, eating those grass grasshoppers was disgusting. So feel free to pause the video here and uh, take notes or just look at it a little bit at your own pace. Okay. 
We're going to switch gears just a little bit here, and we're going to talk about, well, how do we understand prejudice when we tend to have prejudice against others? Okay, so that's basically prejudice. A good definition is negative attitude toward people who belong to a specific social group. So things, I gave some examples like racial, racial and ethnic groups. Okay. That's a specific group. Um, any differences that may exist between members of different racial and ethnic groups are far similar, smaller, excuse me, than differences among various members of the same group. Okay, going forward here just a little bit here. Give me just a moment here. There we go. Okay. So, so also certain stereotypes can lead to prejudice as well. You know, holding on to certain stereotypes. So basically stereotypes, you know, you can see here I put typically include uh, qualities that are unrelated to the objective criteria that define a given category. Okay. So, well, you know, so what is, so basically a cluster of characteristics associated with all members of a specific group or people. That's another way of looking at stereotype. And another way to look at it was, is when we hold a certain belief uh, of one group, when we're, you know, we, when we're a member of one group and we hold certain beliefs about members of another group. Okay, so at the very bottom of this, you know, as we're talking about stereotypes, you know, that's can be kind of a uh, controversial topic, um, but we tend to uh, engage in stereotype. Basically, we want to keep in mind that individuals engage in stereotypical behavior because well, that's a cognitive process that they engage in, you know, to uh, basically they're trying to simplify the social information that they are receiving. Okay, just leave it at that. Okay, so we already talked about, you know, certain, you know, I get the, um, on this slide, I just gave you some examples of certain stereotypes, okay? Okay, going forward. Okay, so when we're talking about stereotypes and prejudice, well, we're, there's a couple couple of terms I want to make you aware of. The first of those is called the in-group, and that's when we tend to believe that basically uh, a person is a member of our social group. Okay, that is, and that leads to in-group bias. And so in-group bias is the tendency to make favorable attributions to members of your in-group. Okay, the second term here that I want to uh, have you focus on is the out group. And basically that is, um, well, when we tend to attribute a, a certain person or a group of people as belonging to a different social group than our group. Okay, so the social group to which one does not belong. Okay, and so kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, is what's, you know, from in-group bias is out-group homogeneity effect. And that's our tendency to basically see members of the out-group as more similar to one another. So that's basically, oh, blah and blah, they're all alike. They all just act this way or they all think this way or behave this way. OK, 
Okay, so a little bit of take a look a little bit about uh, prejudice and negative emotions. And we want to take a look a little bit. Uh, we want to look at that from the neuroscientific perspective. And so this right here is um, a functional MRI, fMRI. And basically, that's examining the brains of participants viewing images of people often stereotyped as being incompetent. And so basically, you know, in this study, you know, participants who viewed these images, they showed higher levels of activity in the prefrontal cortex, as indicated here by the orange spot circled in red right here. And that pattern occurs, you know, when people experience pity, when one is having pity for someone else. That part of the brain is starting, the prefrontal cortex is starting to um, become more active. All right, let's take it a little bit further here. So you might uh, remember here, we did talk, we use a couple of terms like in, implicit and explicit. So basically when it comes to attitudes, um, so when it comes to attitudes and especially prejudice, you know, they've been, well, there's more subtle forms of prejudice according to psychologists. And those are number one here in bold font, implicit attitudes. And that's basically when Basically, we evaluate um, a little more automatic, unintentional, and difficult to control. So our implicit attitudes, basically, you know, they come from within ourselves, and they, they happen a little more automatically. We don't think about those. We don't filter those. So a little more difficult to control. Let's go forward. Okay. All right. So basically, you know, uh, this was uh, called the robber's cave experiment. Okay. And that's when two groups of boys, you know, they, they participated in a series of competitive games, you know, so obviously, you know, two groups, you know, that, well, you know, that led to rivalry, competitive rivalry. Okay. And that basically showed how group hostility could be created and then overcome. So basically, just being a member of one group basically can uh, lead to more hostility toward another group. And that kind of makes sense, you know. And uh, one example we might uh, witness quite often on television uh, during sports uh, events, uh, well, certain uh, individuals that are rooting for one team might tend to become a little more hostile, hostile or engaging in more hostility toward um, members of another group that will be rooting for the other team. It's just an example. Now we have to keep in mind here, you know, so um, what's important to keep in mind and look at a little more in depth, you know, is basically this experiment it demonstrated how group hostility could be created, but then how it could be overcome. All right, so we'll take a look at that just a little more in depth, you know. So, well, um, you know, they're basically uh, their cooperation, you know, they changed the tendency to categorize the out group from those people to we people. So that, re, you know, resulted in less negative stereotypes and prejudices and um, a reduction in uh, basically that intergroup uh, hostility. So what is, to, you know, important to keep in mind from this part of the discussion is basically um, cooperation. Okay, cooperation between groups. Okay. 
and that will um, actually uh, reduce the hostility that might exist between the two groups prior to that. And so, you know, in this example, in this study, you know, students, they were brought together to work on a mutual project. So they were cooperating. So remember, when individuals start to cooperate, they tend to see, you know, a little bit less of those people and start to view everybody as we instead of they. Okay, I'm going to shift gears here just a little bit and we're going to talk about basically what, what happens when we follow the crowd. When one tends to uh, maybe experience that maybe they were engaging in behavior that they ordinarily would not do, but they just became part of the crowd. So um, as we're talking about this, we want to think, you know, keep, keep in mind we want to talk about the term conformity. And conformity means basically, well, adjusting one's in, into um, behavior or opinions so that they match those of the other people or the norms of a social group or situation. So that might explain what happens, cognitively speaking, when an individual engages in behavior that is uncommon to them, but once they became a member of a certain crowd or a group. Okay, the second term I want to make you aware of and talk about a little bit is what's known as social influence. And basically, social influence basically is the study, psycholo psychological study, of how behavior is influenced by the social environment and other people. So basically social psychologists, you know, are in, very interested in this. They want to know like, hey, how does, um, how does the environment and other people tend to affect the cognition and behavior of, of an individual? Okay, so this, um, this researcher, his last name was Ash, okay, and he conducted the study about confirmation, you know, um, co yeah, and conformity, excuse me. And uh, so he basically, you know, well, you know, what uh, Ash found is when it came to uh, influence, and everything, subjects they reported doubt about their own perceptual abilities, you know, which led to their conformance. So basically a um, self-identity and uh, confidence in their own abilities can, um, you know, be a factor in motivating a person to basically uh, think or act in a way that is not usual for themselves. Okay, this is an example of Ash's study. We won't um, worry too much about this right now. Okay, we may talk about that in class, but we will not talk about that in this video. Okay, so culture and conformity. So conformity is higher in collectivistic cultures than in individualistic cultures. Okay, and I gave you some examples um, and of what an individualistic culture is. Okay, they tend to emphasize, you know, independence for each, you know, each person, each as uh, to himself or his herself. Okay, collectivistic cultures, you know, they tend to be, be basically, uh, well, uh, a culture that tends to conform, um, even though they might privately disagree 
with uh, with individuals or whatever, but they still tend to conform to the thoughts and behaviors and stuff of their like family or their um, society. Whereas in an individualistic culture member, um, that means, you know, and each individual basically makes their own decisions and uh, acts whatever way they want to uh, that benefits them. Okay, I just I listed a few of the factors here. I just wanted to make you aware of that. Basically, some of the factors influencing conformity. All right. Um, feel free to pause the video here and uh, take notes or just think about each of these. But basically, you're more likely to conform to group norms. And I will just give just a couple of examples, okay? Basically, um, down below here says you doubt your abilities or acknowledge in a situation. So don't have a lot of confidence in your abilities or knowledge in a certain situation. So you might conform to the group norms. Okay, and last but not least here, at the very bottom here, I wrote strongly attracted to a group. And you want to be a member of it. So you're more likely to conform to the group norms when you want to uh, be a member of that certain group. Okay. We don't have to go into too much elaboration on this slide. I uh, just wanted you to keep in mind, though, that this person, um, Milgram, was a researcher, and um, he conducted a very, very famous, very well-known um, obedience experiment. Okay, and uh, feel free to please uh, look this up either on YouTube or Google this, and you will find the information about this and we will talk about this in class but we don't have enough time to go over this on the video right now okay so just going forward here um, went to uh, just very quick um, Basically, what Milgram, what Milgram found, you know, in his uh, research, basically that uh, individuals, you know, they might tend to, a certain percentage of them might turn to, uh, um, well, doing something that they don't agree with naturally, but they do that because uh, they might be influenced by Take, for instance, uh, somebody, um, I wanna, I'm going to go back one slide here, just want to show you. Well, see, this individual here is wearing a lab coat right here. And so, hence, that person has a, uh, a sense of authority. So, this person sitting down is, is uh, engaging in a certain type of behavior that he wouldn't ordinarily agree with or engage in. But because this person in the white lab coat um, is, uh, has authority. And uh, so we have to keep in mind, you know, that definitely um, certain, um, well, when it comes to uh, advertising and everything, if we uh, ever noticed on television, we may see um, advertisements for a certain uh, drug or a certain type of uh, um, something that they are saying will make us feel better or something that will be good for us. And they, on they usually will have a person talking about it for the, you know they're marketing that pro that product but the person talking about it usually will have a white lab coat and so they're actually still uh, referring you know uh, basically depending on how our um, well being influenced by that sense of authority by wearing a white lab coat <clears throat> 